what we are doing, or who we are with. Hold us to you and build your relationship, build our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. Our gracious Lord, we bring before you the cares and concerns we have for those of our number who are experiencing hardships at this time, trials in strained relationships, trials in financial affairs, and hardships in health. In particular, Lord, we want to bring Candy Gamble before you. Lord, we know that she's been in hospital these past three weeks receiving treatment, and by all accounts that she'll be uh, in hospital for yet another week. We pray, Lord, that this uh, treatment she's been receiving would be effective, and Lord, that she would be rid of these infections once and for all, and that she would be restored to fellowship with us as soon as possible. Father, we pray for all our church family who carry burdens and that through their struggles they would find rest and renewed hope in you. Father, we pray for our children's ministries this evening. We thank for the opportunity we have of ministering to the children through Sunday school. Thank you for the opportunity we as teachers have had during this past term of teaching these young ones the truths of, from your word. And thank you that they have responded to the teaching so well. We thank you for the, those who are involved in the teaching, for the teachers who have been diligent in preparing week in and week out to teach the children. We pray that as they enter a few weeks of rest over this Easter time, that they would be recharged in their zeal for you and for teaching the, these young lives. Father, we pray also for our Rockies group that meet on the second Friday evening of each month and ask that you would bless the children for all those who are involved in that ministry. Please grant the children a zeal for spending time with their church friends at Rockies and a desire, too, to invite friends from outside the church. We pray that you will grant all those who assist in this ministry a fresh realization of the awesome responsibility they have of involving themselves in service in this way. Most of all, Lord, we would ask that you'd be glorified and that those involved in serving the ministry would be edified in the ministry of, this, of, of our church. And now we pray, Father, that you would please be with Andrew as he brings us your word this evening. Make us attentive to what you have to say to us through him. Grant him a peace and a boldness to preach what you have laid on his heart. And in praying for ourselves, Lord, we ask that you would make us increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that you may establish our hearts blameless in holiness before you at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Until then, Father, we pray that we will become and remain grounded in your word, in prayer, and in fellowship, so that we can give a defense for what we believe, and so be effective instruments in your hands to bring your gospel to bear on the lives of those who are lost without you. We offer you these supplications, not for ourselves, but for the name of our Lord Jesus and Savior, our, uh, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good evening, everybody. Psalm 146. Hallelujah, my soul, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles and man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. Happy is the one whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects foreigners and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Zion, your God, reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. People of the risen King, let's stand and sing to our Lord.
is in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven, and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim. Rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside. King I woke, for there my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine forevermore, Christ is mine forevermore, Christ is mine forevermore. appears, our hope will be complete, our longings finally rest as we fall at His feet. When Jesus comes to reign, restoring everything, our tears will turn to tides of praises to our King. will be undone, all wickedness will end as mercy overcomes, the Savior will renew what sin had torn apart, His light will drive the shadows from our weary hearts, we're longing for that day when we'll see. Turn to side. 
life appears These trials that weigh us down Will fade and fall away as we receive a crown And death will disappear Its rule and reign destroy Beneath the weight of glory and eternity Father, we worship you. We are so grateful for your son. We're so grateful, Lord, that you, we will behold your glory, the glory of our King forever. Our faith will turn to sight when Christ, our life, appears. Amen. Good evening, Hillcrest Baptist. Lovely to see you. Thank you for braving the cold and the wet. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would strengthen our hearts and our minds. Perhaps after a long and tiring day, that we might hear your voice speak to us through your word. As we consider the life of the Apostle Paul, your servant, and what you made him to be by your grace, we pray that we might know the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us through the word that he inspired. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the next in the series of The Big Picture, and tonight we come to the book of 2 Corinthians the life of a faithful church leader. The slides, are there's quite a lot of information on the slides. They will be on the website fairly soon. So if you're not able to take notes and all the notes, you'll be able to get that soon. So what is the purpose of the book of 2 Corinthians? Tonight we're covering the whole book in one session just to get a feel for what is the main lesson from this book and what is it wanting to teach us. Here, I believe, in a nutshell, is what the book is about. Just three quick things. It's the inner life and heart of the Apostle Paul. The book is full of that. Paul also describes his experiences in his life. And we also see from the Apostle Paul the theology that motivated him. So those three things. We therefore get, in the book of 2 Corinthians, a unique glimpse into the heart, the life, and the motivations of a faithful leader in the church. So that's an important point for you to remember. That is the book of 2 Corinthians in a nutshell. Here are just two samples um, from from the book, and you can see Paul giving us um, his inner inner motives, his his passion, and his emotions. Uh, From 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. He is sharing what his emotions were and what he was experiencing. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. So Paul is telling us in this letter what's going on in his heart and mind, and we really get to grips with this servant of the Lord. By way of introduction, though, as we think about church leaders, 
here is a portrait of a modern mega church leader. So this is an article from a secular website called The Richest, and they've got different categories, the richest of this, and one of the categories I was interested to see was that of pastors or church leaders. So um, as I said, coming from a secular point of view, what their view is of what they see as the great church leaders in the world today. These are the richest pastors in America. And there they list them. I hope you can see some of the names. There are quite a few of them going from around about $20 million, going all the way to Kenneth Copeland, $300 million. When you convert that into rands, these guys are billionaires and multi-billionaires. That's their estimated net worth. This is where Joel Osteen lives. One family, I guess, lives in all of that, uh, in a large mansion with private jets. And he says, don't focus on what you don't have. That's his secret to success. Um, how does Joyce Meyer travel? Well, this was another quote from the website. Um, she owns several homes around the world, and she travels now in her own private jet, which has been upgraded. And that is a picture of um, the same model of the private jet that she travels around in. So without judging the hearts and motives of current megachurch leaders, how do their lives, though, their lives and their ministries, how do they compare to the Apostle Paul, this model of God's servant given to us in 2 Corinthians? So, just very important, some qualifications. We are not saying that faithful church leaders, that they have to go through all the experiences of the Apostle Paul. After all, Billy hasn't been whipped to within inches of his life. We are grateful to know that. I have not been shipwrecked, although I did have a bad experience with a boogie board once on North <laughs> Beach. Bruce hasn't been robbed by bandits yet. Brahm, we're going to leave Brahm out of this one because <laughs> he's had some bad experiences in his military training, but that was not for the gospel, right? So, so we are not saying that we, that faithful church leaders have to go through everything that Paul went through um, and that they have to be as poor and deprived often as the apostle Paul, but Paul is given to us and an example of the general character and life of a faithful church leader. And that is important. Because the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul does in this book describe the false super apostles. And they are characterized by these types of things. They commend themselves and they boast. We're not going to go into any of these texts. They twist scripture for material gain. That is what they are about. They love the outward appearances. They are the ones who would have a marketing company. They would be photoshopped. Um, if they appeared on TV, they would have their hair done. So really do focus on the outward appearance. And ultimately, Paul says of their ministry that they enslave the people who follow them. I mean, just think of some of the, the prophets that we have here in Africa. Just the types of things um, and the apostles, the types of things that they do, many of them sexually exploiting their church members, some even trafficking in them, spraying doom into their faces, and enslaving believers. That is their ministry. And these qualities, these false super apostles, are contrasted with the life and character of the apostle Paul. Four headings for us tonight. The first heading is going to be the longest. So after the first heading, you think, oh boy, we're we here till nine o'clock tonight. It won't be like that. Um, but I've also got a few slides, but I'm hoping that we're going to be just come in at 30 minutes. So hang in there. The first point. So I just believe as we look at the book of 2 Corinthians, just four main points that we need to think about church leaders. First of all, 
the circumstances that shape a faithful Christian leader. Let's look at some of them. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 to 9. This is what Paul is describing what his life was like. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. So that's quite, that's quite a tough life. We often think that the Apostle Paul just had it all together. He got these wonderful um, revelations from the Lord. He knew exactly what to do. He knew what was going on. And look what he even says there about himself. we perplexed. There are times when we do not know what is going on. We do not know what is coming next. And we don't always know what God is planning in our lives. He was perplexed, persecuted, struck down. That was much of his life. And it starts getting even worse from 2 Corinthians 6. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distress, in stripes. That means that he was whipped and beaten. In imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. He was spoken evil of, he was unknown, he was chastened, he was sorrowful. As having nothing, he was materially poor, yet possessing all things. And if you think that was bad, he goes on in the book, and so just look at all that that's underlined, what characterized his life. From the Jews, in verse 24, I received 40 stripes minus Five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Usually one of those floggings, 39 stripes, would kill a person. He received it five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, Gentiles. And he goes on, often hungry, often sleepless, and what, and the other things, uh, besides the other things which come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. That is a hectic life. Why? Why would God do that to one of his most eminent apostles and servants that he called? We are told exactly why God did this. For we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Do you see what God is doing through these circumstances? He is removing self-reliance in godly Christian leaders. And we have such trust through Christ towards God Not that we are sufficient for ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Removing self-sufficiency from Christian leaders, that is what God is doing, so that they do not think that they are great, they do not trust in their gifts, they do not trust in their personalities, and they realize, I am not sufficient for anything. That is what The circumstances in Paul's life did for him. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So many charismatic leaders trust in their magnetic and charismatic personality to win people over, to motivate them. Paul just realized, I am weak. I am nothing in myself so that the power in his ministry would come from God and not from himself. That is what the circumstances did for the apostle Paul. This was his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12. What was the thorn in the flesh all about? Some of those things that are underlined there. 
lest I should be exalted above measure. To, to remove pride from the Apostle Paul, he was given weakness so that the power of Christ might rest upon him. Do you see what God is doing? How he is molding a faithful Christian leader through difficult circumstances, through hardship, through trials, so that they despair of themselves, they realize their gifting is nothing, their strength is small, it is all of God. Those are the circumstances that are essential for a Christian leader. The actual circumstances might vary, but this is what God is doing. Removing self-confidence, self-sufficiency, and pride. Removing a trust in gifting or charismatic personality. And as Billy told us this morning, excellent. To make Paul realize his dependence on God. As believers, we all need those things. But as a Christian leader, you have to. You have to experience those things. And so God sends difficulties into the lives of his leaders in the church. And we can make this statement. A life of wealth, opulence, ease, comfort, popularity, never made anyone holy, humble, and effective. Is that not true? It's in trials and difficulties, circumstances that perplex us, that strike us down, that God molds the character of his church leaders. We don't want it, but it is absolutely necessary for all Christians and especially for church leaders. Okay, our second heading, we're moving on. The key doctrines that motivate a faithful Christian leader, I believe this comes out strongly in the book of 2 Corinthians. In other words, how did Paul endure that kind of a lifestyle? All those hardships and difficulties, what kept him going? And so I believe that the doctrines in the book of 2 Corinthians are not random doctrines that Paul just thought, oh, let me speak about the resurrection. They were key doctrines in his heart that kept him going as he went through these difficulties in his Christian ministry. And I just want to point out three, I believe, of the main ones. Three doctrines which have to be in the hearts of Christian leaders, in all Christians, but in Christian leaders, that are going to keep them going when things get difficult. Firstly, an assurance of the resurrection and heavenly reward and home, an assurance that our reward is in heaven and that we have a home in heaven. There are two samples. I'm just going to read the one highlighted in red. Listen to, listen to the heart of the Apostle Paul as he reflects on what is coming. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Just as he went through all these difficulties, he could even say that they were light because he looked to the resurrection and the coming reward and his home in heaven. Absolutely essential for believers and especially for Christian leaders. That will keep you going when things don't go well in the ministry. Secondly, in the heart of the Apostle Paul, was this doctrine of being ambassadors of an excellent ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. That comes out in quite a dominant way in the book of 2 Corinthians. Look what Paul says. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Christian leaders need to be captivated by the excellence of the ministry that they have been called to. 
so that when things get difficult, they realize it is worth it. As believers, we should be captivated by the excellence of the ministry that God has called us to, preaching the glorious gospel of Christ to people around us. But Christian leaders and pastors and elders especially need to have the sense of God's calling to an excellent and excellent ministry. In other words, this is worth going through hardship and difficulty because this is a worthy way to spend my life. So kept, Paul was captivated by the excellence of his ministry and that he was Christ's ambassador. That is not a light thing, and it wasn't a light thing to him. Thirdly, I believe there's an emphasis in the book of 2 Corinthians on a separation to holiness, a separation to God and to holiness. Paul says this, he starts off the passage with, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He's telling, separate yourself out from very close associations with unbelievers. And then he goes on and says, as God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is, what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my son's and daughters, says the Lord. And so I believe one of the doctrines that really motivated the Apostle Paul was to realize that God has called me out of this world to be holy and devoted to him. So he forsook the goals and the values of the world, the world running after money and fame and prestige, and he forsook all of those things. God has called me into his service to be holy to him. And he's my father and I'm his son. And so I will go through these difficulties because, and I will renounce the things of this world because I've been called to holiness and to purity for the Lord. Third point tonight. The resultant character of a faithful Christian leader. So God places them in circumstances to mold them, to rid them of self-sufficiency, and they have these inner motivations of doctrine and truth, and those together mold a Christian character which is essential to be a Christian leader. So there are eight of them, and I'm listing them, and I'm just going to very briefly just mention them, on one or two, I'm going to pause with a scripture reference, so we can't go into all of this. This is just a big picture view, and I don't want to get into the details of looking at the picture of the nose and the eyebrows. Number one, Paul had an openness of heart to other believers, especially to those who hurt him. I just want to say about Paul really loved the Corinthians. They were special to him. He loved all um, the churches and these believers. And do you know that the Corinthian Christians are the ones that hurt him the most? They were the ones who were listening to the super apostles who were criticizing Paul. And if you read 2 Corinthians, Paul saying to them, I love you guys. I've given my life for you. How come you don't love me back? And yet, he didn't close his heart to those people who hurt him. Often those we love the most hurt us the most. And yet he didn't try and preserve himself and so that he wasn't exposed to hurt again. If you read some of those passages, he says, my heart is open to you. So openness of heart. Christian leaders need to have an openness of heart to the flock and to the people that they have care over. A willingness to forgive, that comes out strongly with the Apostle Paul. Just as he has been forgiven by the Lord, he was willing to forgive others, and those passages speak of that. Joy and hope in trials, I think that goes without saying. The Apostle Paul, even through difficulties, rejoiced, and he had the strong hope in the resurrection and his reward. A deep and sincere love for others. Doesn't love 
need to characterize a Christian leader if God is the God of love. Just one passage. Uh, I think I've mentioned this. I read this before, I think. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. And so a Christian leader needs to be characterized by love, by love for the flock, deep and sincere and abundant. Humility to associate with the poor and the needy. So this one I had to think a little bit about. Why in the book of, is it in the book of 2 Corinthians that Paul has two chapters on being generous in giving to the needy and the poor amongst believers? And why is he involved in collecting money for the saints? He was going around the churches of Macedonia collecting money for the needy believers in Jerusalem who were persecuted. He was going to collect the money. He's urging the churches. He was going to take it himself, and he was going to travel all the way back to Jerusalem, and he was going to spend time with those poor, needy, persecuted believers. He was going to visit with them. They were obviously on his heart. There is something really ugly with people who are pursuing an outward appearance. They sit in their mansions and they write out checks to charity to give an outward appearance of generosity so that they can put on their websites or whatever, yes, we support all these uh, charities and we give to these needy causes. But they don't go and visit the people. They rather want to rub shoulders with celebrities. They want to be presidential advisors. That's the circles that they love to be seen in and they love to, people they love to rub shoulders with. And it is an outward show. That was not the Apostle Paul. He was actually collecting money. He was going to travel back and he was going to sit down and he was going to pray with the poor believers, the persecuted. He was going to encourage them he was going to give money to them. Because of his deep humility, he loved to be associated with the poor and the needy. It wasn't just an outward show for somebody else to see. I need to just take one minute just to tell you about how this works. So many years ago, you won't know who then who am I referring to. We had an outreach campaign, not Christian, uh, for work. Um, into one of the um, township areas, and our job was to refurbish this crash. So we went in there um, early in the morning, and we were sanding down walls, and we were picking up litter and trying to um, refurbish and upgrade this crash. So during mid-morning, in comes the deputy mayor with the entourage, and photographers, this is literally how it happened. The little two or three cars come in, park, she gets out in her flashy clothes, she gets into an overall, she takes a paintbrush, she dips it in paint, she starts painting the wall, she looks at the cameras, and they take a few photos. Two minutes later, she puts it down, she takes off the overall, they get into the car, and they're gone. You see, that's outward appearance, celebrity status, you actually don't care about those people. It's all about outward show. That was not the Apostle Paul. Deep care, rubbing, rubbing shoulders with the poor and the needy, not being too proud to associate with them. One wonders with many of our mega church leaders who do give to charity, you often do not see them actually rubbing shoulders and getting their hands dirty with the poor and needy amongst God's people. Okay. Not afraid to use authority and to confront sin. I'm not going to go into any text, but read the book of 2 Corinthians and you're going to see 
that there is a section in the book of 2 Corinthians where Paul is actually quite straightforward towards those people and towards their sin. And he tells them, when I come again, be aware that I am coming with authority and I'm going to deal with this sin. He was not a pushover and he was not, a, not afraid to use his authority for Christ's glory. And that is important also in a church leader. Not handling the word of, uh, sorry, handling the word of God with sincerity. And I want to read a passage here. Quite important. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. So Paul's saying about himself, we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Peddling the word of God. That word means perverting it or distorting the word of God. And what it means is for self-gain. That's what it means to peddle the word of God. In other words, people see the Bible as a means of getting rich. Distorting the word of God, scheming, distorting the word of God to speak to people what they want to hear so that they will give to your ministry and make you rich and popular. Peddling the word of God. And look what that text says, even in the Apostle Paul's time. For we are not as so many. There are many people in this world and in our current world who peddle the word of God. They are using that word, they are twisting it to make money. And that's what we see. And the Apostle Paul was different. We are speaking in the sight of God and we do not peddle the word of God. You will find in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul even describes how he could have charged and expected the Corinthians to pay for his living normal wages. And he said, I don't even want that. I will do my tent making ministry and I will work late at night to earn money to support myself so that I'm not a financial burden to you. Absolutely not peddling the word of God for money. So our pastors, our full-time pastors, do need to earn a salary from the work of the ministry. The Bible says that those who preach the gospel must live from the gospel. But not to build mansions and not to fly around in private jets. It is for a normal, basic salary to support yourself and your family. It is not to get rich. And that's what we see much in the world today. Last one, simplicity, and we're right near the end, simplicity and godly sincerity. And I'm going to leave this for now because I'm going to comment on it soon. And we come to our last very short, very short heading. The overall ethos of a faithful Christian leader. I do understand the word ethos also means character, and we've just seen a whole lot of characteristics, but I'm taking this as... So if we had to ask the Apostle Paul, what is the overarching ethos of your character or of you in the Christian ministry? I believe, and he might correct me when we get to heaven, I believe that this 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12 is Paul's ethos of life. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world, in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. This, I believe, is the heart of the Apostle Paul. Not with fleshly wisdom. You can just, just listen to that tone. Just in sincerity, simplicity, not photoshopping, photoshopping images to give himself a flashy presentation, not hiring image consultants to perk up his ministry and to make him look flashy and acceptable to people, just simplicity and godly sincerity before the world. That was the Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, trusting that the Lord would bless his ministry and prosper his ministry as God wanted him to do. So as we come to the end, last slide. Modern church leaders versus the life and character of the Apostle Paul. How 
do they compare? When you are looking for a church or a ministry to support, you have to look at the leaders and the elders. Do they resemble, to some degree, the life, the, the motivations of the Apostle Paul? Um, it is not just mega church leaders. I have met with some of the pastors of the denominations around us, and many of them are thinking like the mega church leaders. They just haven't got there yet. But they are thinking, how can I grow this ministry? How can I grow the numbers? As soon as they grow the numbers, what increases? The number of missionaries they support? No, their salaries increase. Their cars increase and their houses increase. And I was so surprised when one of those people came to see me and he asked for counseling and, and advice about his ministry. And after the third or fourth meeting, I just realized this guy's in it because he wants to build this big church and he wants popularity and he wants fame and he wants money. And he hasn't got there yet, but that's what his aim is. And quite a few men coming out of, the, coming out of seminary in particular denominations, that is their aim. And that's what they're looking for in the ministry and that is scary. So you always look for a church or for a ministry Look at the Christian leaders, and they will tell you the character of the ministry. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of the, your servant, the Apostle Paul, as he reflected even the life of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. Heavenly Father, I would pray for the elders at HBC, that we might in some way reflect the character and the life of the Apostle Paul, that you would protect us from pride, from lording it over, from seeking money or church growth for the sake of church growth. Lord, make us to be faithful Christian leaders here at this church. And I would pray, Lord, that you would Continue to raise up more elders and Christian leaders at HBC that would follow in the example of the Apostle Paul. And we look to you, Lord, to raise up new elders um, for new generations in this church. And Lord, we would just pray for the worldwide church. As we see so many things going wrong, we would pray that you would send revival that you would remove pride, the love of money from your church and that every Christian leader might be living a life of simplicity and godly sincerity before you and the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me and let's sing together. Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin Left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change a leper's thoughts and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.